This is CBC Here and Now. Fishing for cod, but finding so much more. The circling shark story is just ahead. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald said play ball. We were ready to play ball. COVID restrictions have changed a lot for the Cornerbrook Baseball Association, including the opening of their new clubhouse. I'll explain it all tonight. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes. Well, we are starting another winning streak. Government says there are no new cases of COVID-19 to report today for the third day in a row, but there are new cases in Prince Edward Island today that appear to be connected to a hospital emergency room, and that has health officials warning the Atlantic bubble should not expand any further at this time. PEI's chief public health officer says a healthcare worker in the ER tested positive for COVID-19. As a result, hundreds of staff and patients are now being tested there. Another confirmed case appears to be connected. An 80-year-old woman who came in contact with the healthcare worker also tested positive. She went to the hospital last week. Now, these new cases are among a half dozen others on PEI that have surfaced over the past week or so, and now PEI's chief medical officer is cautioning that the Atlantic region should not not be considering any other expansions to its bubble. And none of our eight active cases are related to travel within the bubble. But this situation raises questions about the possibility of the Canadian bubble. Although ultimately this is not my decision, I believe it would be premature today to be considering a further loosening of our, our border restrictions and encouraging um, broader travel. Um, and certainly that will be reconsidered as we go forward, but uh, not today. As we have said from the very beginning, we will follow the evidence. And if the evidence uh, suggests that uh, uh, in the interest and safety of Islanders, we need to begin to scale back, uh, whether it's uh, travel, whether it's uh, any other aspects of our renewal PEI plan, uh, we will let the evidence do that. But I think the, uh, the next uh, 24 to 48 hours are, are important uh, and uh, will guide us uh, going forward. Now, initially, health officials in Atlantic Canada said July 17th might be the target date to expand the Atlantic bubble. But last week, Premier Dwight Ball suggested that target would be moved. Meanwhile, following a surge of cases in the U.S., more public health officials will be, will be placed at the American-Canadian land border to bolster COVID-19 screening. The changes include three land border crossings in New Brunswick, where people would cross into the Atlantic bubble. Travelers who pose a risk will be sent to health officials for a second assessment. The locations with this on-the-ground support account for 90% of travelers into the country. Non-commercial land crossings have nearly doubled since March. The U.S.-Canada border shutdown remains in effect until July 21st. Well, a young woman was killed in a moose vehicle collision over the weekend. It happened on Route 300 near Carmenville. Police say the 17-year-old passenger was found in critical condition. She was airlifted to hospital where she later died. The driver suffered non-life-threatening injuries. RCMP is investigating the crash. Well, the police search for a serial predator in the Bay St. George area is over. The RCMP arrested 44-year-old Matthew Francis O'Quinn early this morning. Police had been looking for him since Thursday. They say he was unlawfully at large after he didn't comply with a long-term super supervision order. O'Quinn had been found guilty of forcible confinement and uttering threats in 2012 and was labeled a long-term offender in 2015. Now at that time, a judge said he is a significant and ongoing danger to the public and to women in particular. Police say he was under a long-term supervision order in Ontario when he went missing. Police found him early this morning at a home in Stephenville Crossing. The RCMP says officers surrounded the house and negotiated with him for 45 minutes before he surrendered peacefully. Well, quite the fright for a boatload of friends over the weekend. The group nearly hooked 
a shark while cod jigging off Change Islands. One was circling their boat trying to snatch their catch. Oh my, like my husband could have touched it with his hand. That's how close it was to the motor. Came, came down a broke service at the back of the boat. Um, the whole dorsal fin is back and uh, more or less you, know, you get that sort of Giles look where he comes up and sort of looks at you and wondering what's going oh, wow. on. And I really, I seriously could have reached out and, and touched him. Probably not a good idea. Uh, we will hear more from that couple coming up later in the show. Well, if you're out fishing for appliances during the pandemic, you aren't alone. Turns out lots of people are in the market for a new washer or dryer or deep freeze. But as Terry Roberts reports, as COVID wears on, getting the product you might want might just be a challenge. Yeah, I haven't seen anything like it before. Dan Mercer is appliance manager at Atlantic Home Furnishings in Mount Pearl. 25 years in the business, never thought he would make a statement like this. The supply and demand chain has absolutely switched. There's more demand for product than there is supply. Furniture manufacturers are still recovering from the pandemic. And I've got containers of product on order of the basic products that I don't know when I'm going to see. There's no ETA on it. At the same time, Customers are flocking to the stores. What's happening is that customers are at home more, so they're, they're wanting to change things at home like furnishings and appliances. We've had an influx of people interested in purchasing new things for their home. Stores are scrambling to get their hands on appliances and furniture, and the wait times for some products have doubled. While Cohen's has been receiving shipments and can meet the needs of most customers. It's been difficult regarding obtaining inventory from our suppliers. Factories have closed. The last four to five months have been very challenging. Anybody who wants to buy product today, if I don't have it in stock, you could be waiting 8, 10, 12, 14 weeks for product, right? But it's starting to ease up. It's starting. I can see more products starting to come in, you know, different varieties, but it, it, it's still a big challenge. I would look at the lower decibel. Okay. Usually we come in and product is available immediately. Now there's quite a wait. It's resulting in frustration for some customers, including Maxine Tucker, who decorates the home each year for the Canadian Heart of Hearing Dream Home Lottery with a $40,000 budget. Right now we are very limited to the amount of stock that's here. We're very limited to the appliances. Hopefully we'll meet our goal. I mean, if not, I'm in trouble. Um, you know, the, the um, appliance people are really going out of their way to get us the product that we need. If not, they're substituting. There is some relief for customers though. So far, prices have remained stable. We're not seeing a huge inflation of pricing. We don't know exactly what is going to come down the pike, especially as uh, maybe some supplies are harder to source, harder to find. But as of right now, we are very lucky, again, that we've been around for 100 years. We've worked very closely with the suppliers that we deal with. So we have not had to absorb any extra costs and pass that on to the customer. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, now to Labrador, where five fires are still burning. There were six over the weekend, but the one on the outskirts of Mealy Mountains National Park, the closest one to any property, has been put out. The remaining fires are mostly contained or under control, except for the one near Sandy Island Lake, which is currently estimated at 203 hectares in size and 25% contained. Since Friday, two air tankers, three helicopters, three pump units, Units and a number of personnel have been deployed. Well, COVID-19 restrictions are everywhere, even the baseball field. Children are staying two bats apart at Jubilee Field in Cornerbrook. Here now's Colleen Connors explains how COVID is changing the game. Construction is almost finished on the new building, with the last of the bricks going on this month. Jubilee Field looks the same, but COVID has changed a lot this season. All 300 minor baseball players have to wash their hands before entering and stay away from their friends. The association says it adopted all the proper rules. To once uh, Dr. Fitzgerald said play ball, we were ready to play ball. Uh, we didn't want to wait. We wanted to be ready to go.
And when it comes to the actual game, players have to stand two baseball bats apart, even while standing on the bases. Gear is constantly sprayed with sanitizer. Baseball is such that they can play, they can practice, they can do drills and skill development stuff without having to be sweating on each other or pushing each other or leaning on one another. So it's working out pretty well. While these children learn the game, beyond the fence, the $1.8 million clubhouse is almost finished. We're just really excited to know that in a month, uh, we're going to have an umpire's room, we're going to have two really nice change rooms. We're going to have a minor baseball room, a new canteen, and some public washrooms. I can't tell you how pleased we all are. The whole baseball community is to have that to look forward to. The old clubhouse was dark, dingy, and falling apart. Demolition happened in the fall, and the construction of the new clubhouse started in the winter. The health pandemic delayed shipment of some materials, but the new facility should be ready mid-August but the players may not get to use it at all this year. Well, I'm not sure we're going to get, a place, get to a place this summer where we could put 15 or 16 players in the change room to chat pre-game, to talk post-game. I'm not sure we're going to get to that point this year. For now, the Baseball Association will enforce distancing on the field and hope for the grand opening of their clubhouse next season. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Well, the RNC is issuing a warning to anyone who have, may have listed their home for sale with 3% realty over the past few years. Officers say the business on Carwood Drive in Paradise was broken into overnight and items were stolen. As a result, anyone who had listed their home with 3% home with realty within the last five years and had not changed their locks since should make contact with the business. In the meantime, anyone with information regarding the break and enter is asked to contact the police or crime stoppers. Well, the oldest ship in the Canadian Coast Guard fleet will return to service next month after spending three of the last four years in refit. The research vessel Hudson is set to leave the St. John's shipyard and resume science missions in the North Atlantic like it's been doing for almost six decades. Paul Withers reports. The storage ship has spent so much time out of the water that it's news when it's actually able to go to sea. The Coast Guard says that's now the case. Well, certainly uh, the, uh, the work that we carried out uh, it's meeting all the regulatory and operational requirements of the vessel. Uh, when the vessel sails at the end of August, early September, it will be, be able to meet all of its requirements for the, uh, for the coming years. We're working both with Transport Canada and class societies in order to, uh, uh, to get it fully operational. The last few pieces, of course, is when it leaves the shipyard. It'll undergo its mobilization and uh, it'll get its operational certificates, but there'll be no restrictions on the vessel. For the last year and a half, the 57-year-old Hudson has been completing phase two of a life extension refit at the New Dock shipyard in St. John's. The original $10 million budget nearly doubled and the job took twice as long as scheduled after lead paint and asbestos was discovered. Unexpected heating and ventilation problems also needed fixing. Finding those parts took time. All of that on top of scheduled work and the pandemic this spring. The life extension actually started in 2017 in a Hamilton shipyard where it too encountered unexpected problems and delays. But all of that is now in the past. We hope the, uh, to still see the vessel at the St. John's uh, Coast Guard base in the coming, uh, in the coming days. And we'll, we'll depart over to BIO. Uh, sometime in uh, probably around the 1st of August. Hudson's first mission will be to deploy moorings to detect whales, and then it will carry out ocean climate monitoring off the East Coast. The ship is now capable of remaining in service until its replacement is ready. For a vessel life extension, uh, the life has been extended now, and uh, the Hudson will be uh, with us till 2024. An end to an endless refit and the end in sight for a vessel that has carried generations of Canadian scientists to sea. Paul Withers, CBC News, Halifax. Well, a beloved Pakistani restaurant in St. John's is embroiled in turmoil after the owner says her restaurant was stolen. The owner of International Flavors says the landlord changed the locks and now a new owner is selling food using her recipes and her equipment. Heather Gillis reports. Talat Mian operated International Flavors here on Kittivity Road for 17 years. During the pandemic, the 67-year-old negotiated a reduction in rent while the restaurant was closed. Then she worked out a deal to sell her business to Justin Fong so she could retire. 
but in mid-June, the day before she planned to train the new owners to cook her recipes, the locks on the doors to her business were changed, even though she'd paid her reduced rent for that month. But now Talatnian says people were operating her restaurant using her recipes and equipment as late as Friday. Her lawyer has sent a cease and desist letter, and the sign has been removed from the front of the building. Looks like it's uh, stolen from me. I feel that it's stolen from me. She says all of her belongings are still in the restaurant, though she has received some things like a visa machine. My corporation certificate is there, my all the personal, some papers, they are there, cash flow in the cash register. Landlord Mike O'Day wouldn't do an on-camera interview, but he told CBC News that if Mian wasn't reopening, she'd have no control over the plan going forward. As for her belongings, O'Day says she can have whatever she wants back. He also said he was working with Fong, but that he changed his mind, though Mian thought it was a done deal. Mike went to talk to Justin at the bureau, and he said it, yes, he will give it to him. Now, 25-year-old Ibrahim Ayub has rented the building as of July 3rd. His sisters worked for International Flavors, but he says once they get all of their licenses, they'll be selling Ethiopian food. He says they were open for Friday on a trial run. People to see. Okay. It's not open just like to, uh, for free, like even last time we were doing for free to try out. People are getting in and seeing it. Yeah. Meanwhile, Talat Mian says this situation isn't about money, it's about ethics. Because it's not the money or anything. I want to have a good control of my legacy. Meanwhile, Talat says she's exploring all options. However, the outcome of any of those options here is far from clear. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the Salvation Army is holding drive-in sermons this summer. The St. John Citadel hosted its first on Sunday. Last month, the Salvation Army said it would keep its churches closed despite faith-based organizations being allowed to have gatherings of fewer than 50 people. The church says drive-ins keep congregations safe and connected. It's expecting Salvation Army churches in other areas of the province to try them out. <laughs> Lots of happy faces uh, in the crowd th this morning as they are not able to uh, be together as they normally would on a Sunday morning, but they're able to wave at each other and just enjoy community in that way. And that's been something that's been really missing over these last months. It's one thing to worship together online and you know everybody else is listening, but to see each other and worship together is, uh, is so important, especially to some people who've been living alone. and watching the service online by themselves. How will we find the way forward? We have an FM uh, uh, receiver system so that uh, they can, you know, if they can hear the service by just rolling down their windows, that, that's great. Otherwise, they can just uh, put on their, their radio tune to 102.5 FM and just enjoy the service very clearly, uh, just listening in their vehicle. I think people have been uh, longing for this day and uh, it's finally arrived and we're adapting to this new normal right now and doing the very best that we can to provide an opportunity for people to, to uh, enjoy a service and to be able to uh, you know, listen to it so that uh, the experience can be as, as meaningful uh, as it possibly can for those who, who will join us. Oh my God, I'm so happy. So happy, I'm so happy. My dream. Five hundred dolls, all donated, a cherished collection and a charitable act coming up.
This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Well, it's weather time. Ashley is on vacation, so I'm going to try my best to fill in for her while she's gone. Let's start with looking at the highs today. It was a hot one for most of the island. 26 degrees in St. John's with the humidex. It felt more like 33 today. Much cooler in Labrador, though, but things are going to start to change up there. So here's your weather on the way headlines. Tomorrow on the island, we're going to start to see temperatures slide. There's a northeasterly wind coming through that will take those temperatures down for sure. Then we're getting into a very rainy, chilly midweek on the island. But if you're in Labrador, I hope you took this week off for vacation because things are looking really nice. There are a nice stretch of sunshine for most of Labrador this week. So let's have a look at tonight. You can see fairly clear in Lab West tonight. Most of the action is in the Straits in the Northern Peninsula and Southeastern Labrador where there's some showers, mostly cloudy skies for the rest of the island. Temperatures staying fairly warm, 16 degrees degrees overnight uh, in St. John's, a south southerly wind uh, gusting up to 40 there. For Labrador, Happy Valley Goose Bay could see uh, some thunder and lightning tonight and 8 degrees as that overnight low. So looking ahead to tomorrow, things stay pretty cloudy on the island, nice and clear for most of Labrador and those showers continue along the straits there uh, tomorrow as well for southern areas. Lots of uh, places on the island could see spits of showers through throughout the day tomorrow. Now, temperature wise in St. John's, it's going to be 20 degrees, but it's going to be warmer as you move inland. Uh, same story with Placentia and Fairyland. It's going to feel like 18 if you're on the coast, but as you go inland, 27 uh, as the high there. And uh, Clarenville looking at 22 degrees as the high with the chance of some showers tomorrow. Marystown, uh, 21. And you can see in the afternoon, those uh, winds will start to shift to northeasterly, and that's when things are going to start to cool down. So looking at central Newfoundland, 22 for Terra Nova along uh, the south coast. Harbor Breton looking at uh, 20 degrees as the high tomorrow. But as you move inland, once again, it uh, warms up 26 degrees uh, as you move there and a higher humidex as well. On the west coast, looking at temperatures in the upper teens, around 20 degrees in the Stephenville area with that chance of showers throughout the day and Winds there uh, blowing northeasterly as well. As we go up through the straits, temperatures in about the mid teens with some showers. St. Anthony only getting up to a high of 12 degrees, but then look at the rest of Labrador along the coast. Yes, it's uh, a little bit chillier, but in Labrador City, looking at a nice sunny day, 20 degrees, Churchill Falls, Happy Valley Goose Bay, looks like it's uh, shaping up to a really nice day tomorrow. For Wednesday, it's gonna stay nice and bright in Labrador, but on the island, uh, looking at some showers and cloudy skies, for the east and along the south coast. And look at that dip in temperatures. Yes, 11 degrees as the high in St. John's tomorrow. We're gonna stay in this pattern for a couple of days, but in Labrador, looking really nice, 25 in Happy Valley Goose Bay, and uh, as well, Lab City looking quite nice. So as we get into Wednesday overnight into Thursday, uh, it's gonna stay pretty nice in Labrador. Showers sticking around uh, for the east. Temperatures staying very chilly. Uh, in St. John's, 11 degrees again on uh, Thursday, but warming up there in central areas. Grand Falls, Windsor looking at 19, Cornerbrook 19, and 28 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Even the coast looking at uh, temperatures in the 20s. So things will start to rebound in the east as we head into the weekend, 15 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. And then we're going up to uh, 20 with some cloud cover on Saturday. For central and the west, things looking quite nice heading into the weekend, getting up to the mid 20s with a mix of sun and cloud. For Labrador, look at Eastern Labrador. That's the spot you wanna be this week for sure. 28, 24, 26, mix of sun and cloud. It doesn't get much better than that. For uh, Western Labrador though, some showers moving through on the weekend there, Friday into Sunday. Saturday rather. Okay, so let's have a look at our uh, weather photo of the day. This comes to us from St. Vincent's and it's actually a series of shots that I wanted to show you. Just look at this. This is some humpback whales feeding off Cape Lynn in St. Vincent. So just some great shots. I wanted to show all of them to you. Thank you so much to uh, Jared Clark for posting that on Twitter. Just beautiful. 
Well, the Royal Canadian Legion is used to taking in donations, but it's not every day that someone offers to donate 500 Barbie dolls. Madonna Porter has been collecting dolls and much more for years. When she decided it was finally time to let the collection go, she wanted to do some good, so she's donating it all to the Legion, where it will be sold at auction. The donation couldn't come at a better time, but before they can convert the dolls into dollars. Legion members had to drive a truck to Porter's home in CBS and pack it all up. I've had a lot of happy days in my life, but I can say this is the happiest. Well, I'm that happy, I'm sad, I'm excited, but is what I want to do in my heart. I started off with the teapots and Barbie dolls. And the Celebration Army, we grew closer and closer. And Tom's on phone down and say, do you have any Barbie dolls? We'll put them away for Donna. Come down and get them. I said, OK. And the dolls came in, paintings came in. Things started to come in, and it's still it's massive. Time was getting bad, and and I'm getting older and sick, whatever. We don't, I'm not going to get into that. And I called Aunt the Legion. I said, oh my God, Chief Harry won't take me serious. Who got 500 Barbie dolls, right? And the next day, God love him. Aunt came up, and he came up. So I think it was meant for them to come and help me through this today, and to take all this away, because my dream is so a long while waiting for it to come true. The uh, first vice president of provincial command spoke uh, a couple of weeks ago on the uh, radio and telling uh, everybody about how bad the legions were doing right now because of the COVID-19 situation and a lot of branches were struggling to survive. So uh, this lady heard him on the news and uh, the next day she called and uh, my wife happened to pick up the phone and the rest is history from there. It's just uh, what a great goodwill gesture it has been because, as you know, branches, especially branch one, uh, we survive on weddings and, and our catering, and that's all been gone right now. Whether we get $10,000 or we get $100,000 is all. It's something we don't have right now, and, and like you say, we're struggling to keep the doors open, so whatever amount we do get, uh, it's so much appreciated. Can't thank her enough for what she's doing. You know, I always say that, don't burn your bridges, right? Because uh, you, you don't know when you're going to have to go back home from there. I'm not going back over no Barbie dolls no more. I don't want to see another one. <laughs> <laughs> and they had another 500 left. Yeah. Coming up, a couple from Change Islands has quite the fish story. They were after cod, and so was another creature. That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, we've seen the video and we've heard the screams. A close shark encounter Saturday off Change Islands. Anthony got the backstory. Well, Carolyn, summertime, beautiful weather these days. A lot of people trying to get out on the water to get their fish. And that's certainly true for a couple in Change Islands who uh, got a little more than they bargained for when they headed out. There's a gun! Right there, there. No, let's move! It's stuff all down here now. I don't know what I'm at. Oh, my! Is it going to no, eat me? No. Joining me now from Change Islands is uh, Peter and Donna Stacy. Welcome to Here and Now. Thanks for Thank having you. us. All right, so the video is quite something. Peter, you're the skipper on the boat, the captain. Set the scene for us. Where were you heading out and what were you doing? Uh, we had some friends out, uh, came out for the day. Saturday was a beautiful day. Uh, so we headed out towards uh, one of the fishing grounds known as the Western Rock of Four Mile. There were five of us in the boat, struck some fish early, and the fishing was good. And then, uh, as you see, uh, the video exploded. Give me a sense of when you realize you're, the fishing is good, you're bringing in your fish, and then all of a sudden you get this visitor, a predator. When did you realize that something special was happening? I would just like to say, too, there was a lady in the boat with us, and this was her first time ever on the ocean. Wow. Besides being on a ferry at one point, this was her first time ever on the ocean, let alone in an open boat out cod fishing. So I said to her, I'm normally a photographer for anybody that Peter takes out fishing. I said to her, give me your phone so I can take some pictures of you when you catch a fish, not if, when you catch a fish. So I right. had her phone and my phone in my hands and she had just moments before pulled in a fish. So I had taken a picture of her. So I had two phones in my hand and then this shark comes out of nowhere this is pre the video even starting, goes around the boat once, then it surfaced the second time and it actually broke. The fin came right out of the water. Yeah, that'll wake you up. Oh my, like my husband could have touched it with his hand. That's how close it was to the motor. Came, came down a broke surface at the back of the boat. Um, the whole dorsal fin is back and more or less, you know, you get that sort of Giles look where he comes up and sort of looks at you. So Dean, Devin and Kelly were in the boat with us and Kelly was there on the tot. And I mean, I panicked, just completely panicked. And I had the two phones in my hand and my husband was saying, are you videoing? Are you videoing? And I mean, that was the last thing I was worried about was a video. So by the time I'm in the kerfuffle, I got my camera going. Only The only thing I got was wherever I moved because there was no intentional videoing of the, of the shark at all. <laughs> No, Don't put your hands out, dear. Don't put your hands out. <laughs> okay. Where's he going? Oh my God, he's eating mine, isn't he? Where's he going? Should I eat? Peter, or what? what should I do? Watch it, watch it, watch it. You're the one, Donna, who's providing that really cool, almost documentary-like commentary about what we're seeing, right? You're, are you the voice that we're hearing? <laughs> Yes, she is, Anthony. Yes, it's me. Gone nuts. I wouldn't call it the, the beautiful commentary. It's gone nuts. I panicked. I wanted him to move, get away from it as fast as we could. Did you explain to your friend that you don't cue the shark every time you take somebody out there, that this isn't an everyday occurrence when you go cod jigging? Yeah, I, I kind of think she realized that being right in front of my voice. So at some point throughout the video, after we've listened to it a few times, Kelly and I are actually the same pitch when, when we're screaming. <laughs> and how big do you figure that shark was? Well, my oh. boat is 19 and a half feet. And I figure he was somewhere between 8 and 10 feet. It was massive. <laughs> <laughs> big. Really big. As it was circling the boat, Donna, were you starting to hear that kind of... Did that enter your mind at all? I was it coming up and grabbing the fish. So I was saying, don't put your hands out over. Because all I could see was this was going to make a grab. Because because both Devin and Kelly had a fish on at the same time. And Dean was trying to get the fish yep. in over. I was just standing there panicking. I really was no contributor to, to helping anybody out. It, it's a fantastic adventure. And... Uh, what a fantastic first fishing trip for your friend. Um, oh, did this yes. scare her away from going cod fishing again, or do you think she'll be back? I don't know. The day was too magnificent, hey, to yeah, not, it was, it was for her not day. to come back, because it was, it was textbook day for on the water. Well, it's in Change Islands, one of the most beautiful spots in the province, and a little bit more special when you can have a close-up encounter with a shark. Thank you both very much, and, and keep those fingers inside the boat when you're fishing out there near Change Islands, will you? 
Okay, thanks, Nancy. Thank Have you. A good day. No, Don't put your hands out there. Don't put your hands out. <laughs> okay. Where's he going? Where's he going? He's eating mine, isn't he? Where's he going? Should I eat Peter? him or what? what should what I do? You want oh! to Well, Peter and Donna saw the shark wild cod fishing this weekend. The recreational cod fishery opened at the start of the month, which means harbors, bays, inlets, and coves have been very busy each weekend with boatloads of people heading out to catch their quota. It also means it's time for the annual age-old debate over how to best fillet a cod. Merle Pitts learned how to fillet a cod when he was a teenager working part-time in a fish plant and on Saturday showed off his method at a wharf in Canning's Cove. Right. Hey, Go on, Leave the door. Yeah. 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 Is the same thing? Same thing. Oh, nice. I keep saying it's funny, you forget it. Air the bone. Oh, nice, you just need an answer. Air the bone, look. Look, 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 well, that's not quite for uh, the squeamish folks of us out there. Uh, that's uh, Merle Pitts showing off his cod filleting skills. Now, Merle is the uncle of Here and Now's senior producer, Lee Pitts, who was among those at the wharf. And that got us thinking, how do you fillet cod? Have you learned any lessons or tips over the years? Where do you stand on the skin off or skin on or skin off debate. And uh, if so, if you have some suggestions or tips, record a video of yourself and send it to us. We'd love to see your skills in action. So you can reach out to us. You can reach out to us through email at hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca. We're also on Facebook and Twitter at cbcnl.
some big winners of East Coast Music Awards from this province over the weekend. The awards were presented Saturday in a taped show that aired on CBC Television and online on the CBC Gem app. Eastern Owl won for Indigenous Artist of the Year. Shani Ganuk was given the Lifetime Achievement Award. And Tim Baker won three awards for Best Video, Folk Recording of the Year and Solo Artist of the Year. The winner is... From St. John's, Newfoundland, Tim Baker. Congratulations to Tim for Forever Overhead. Thank you so much to so many people uh, um, for, for, for helping me make this record. Uh, my producer, Marcus Paquin, uh, my manager, Jason Burns, um, my partner and designer, Nico Paolo, um, Adam Countryman, my agent, Cameron Reed at Arts and Crafts. A boy in bed. You can hear the hot dogs running from the light. Oh, from the light into the dark. That's all I want in my cousin's car. I am so excited to announce the ECMA for Indigenous Artist of the Year goes to Eastern Owl. Congratulations. Okay, cool. We are so excited to win Indigenous Artists of the Year at the ECMAs. And awesome. we want to thank the ECMAs so much for having this celebration despite everything that's going on with COVID-19. On behalf of Eastern Owl, we'd just like to thank a few people. Um, <clears throat> we would like to thank our elders and our community uh, for always supporting our music. We'd like to thank First Light Friendship Center in St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, all the people who worked on our album, Hamasi. Cause all my life, I wanted to be circling and moving to the beat. Now here I am, and now we all meet, and I'm Thanks, Alan, and thank you to the ECMAs for this incredible award. It's an honor to be given this acknowledgement of our career, and we thank you very, very much. We'd also like to thank our parents, previous band members, Charlie Anderson, Brenda O'Reilly, Shelley Chase, Bob Hallett, and Roger Monder. Also, a special thanks to Ralph O'Brien, Dermot O'Reilly, Molsons, Shelley Nordstrom, Lyle Drake, John Steele, and many, many more people who helped us throughout our career. And a special thank you to all our fans who came out and bought our products and came to our shows. Now Georgie, he could build a boat and he's the bike driver. He's the bike could catch the fish and take them home to Lizer. I love to sit on big hot stove and watch the kettle violin. Daddy will buy the baby a fuck when the boss comes home from Swiland. Congratulations to all the winners and the nominees. Well, turning now to some national news, Justin Trudeau is apologizing for his role in a controversy that has dogged the Liberal government for days now. It's over his family's close ties with WE, the charitable organization that was awarded a multi-million dollar contract to administer a student volunteer program. David Cochran has the latest. Being Prime Minister means sometimes having to say you're sorry, and this is one of those times. I made a mistake in not recusing myself immediately from the discussions, given uh, our family's history. And I'm sincerely sorry about not having done that. Sorry for the collapse of the plan to have the WE charity deliver volunteer placements and grants to students. Uh, I am... Uh, sorry, because young people who should be out there uh, volunteering, contributing to their communities through this program will now have to wait a little longer. Sorry for dragging his mother and brother into a political controversy over payments they received from the charity. What I also deeply regret uh, is the fact that I have uh, brought my mother into this situation uh, in a way that uh, uh, you know, is uh, really unfair to her. Sorry for plunging his government into its third formal ethics investigation in just five years. 
I did not know the details, and as I said, I should have known the details, uh, and I regret that. The WE organization is no longer running the program, but it is running ads, saying the charity only did what the government asked and was never going to profit from this, just recover its costs. All of this has the government scrambling to stand up and deliver a program it argued it didn't have the capacity to deliver, which is why it all went to WE in the first place. Trudeau's apology hasn't satisfied the opposition who say this only happened because he was caught and his back was against the wall. They plan to press ahead with a series of investigations at multiple parliamentary committees. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, the Prime Minister addressed other topics today other than the WE controversy. He says his government is extending a program that helps businesses cover 75% of workers' wages. This week, we'll be announcing an extension to the wage subsidy program until December to give greater certainty and support to businesses as we restart the economy. Now, the government boosted the budget of the program last week to $82.3 billion. $18 billion has already been paid out in payroll support to more than 250,000 businesses. Now, the Prime Minister also says Canada and the U.S. are still talking about the ban on non-essential travel. But there are unconfirmed reports the ban will likely be extended until at least mid-August. Salima Shivji has more on that. The numbers keep spiking. More than 15,000 new infections in Florida in one day alone. The latest record straining hospitals to a critical point. We're going to have to start moving regular beds into ICU beds. So too in Texas. We are on the edge. We had 17 uh, more people admitted into our ICUs last night. That's a 10% a increase. Uh, so we're, we're still in a rough place. Some mayors are pleading with the governor for a return to strict lockdown measures. The state still struggling to contain the spread of the virus, even with an order for Texans to wear masks when out in public. As is California, where two large school districts, L.A. and San Diego, say it's too risky to open schools in the fall, sticking to online classes instead. In the midst of it all, the Trump administration has the country's top infectious disease specialist in its sights after Dr. Anthony Fauci's repeated warnings. We're in a very difficult, challenging period right now as we speak. We're met with this. I respect Dr. Fauci a lot, but Dr. Fauci is not 100 percent right. The president's advisors seem keen to undermine Fauci, anonymously sending a list of statements to several media outlets from early on in the pandemic that they say he got wrong when the virus was new and much unknown. An attack the White House is denying. The notion that there's opposition research and that there's Fauci versus the president couldn't be further from the truth. Dr. Fauci and the president have always had a very good working relationship. Just as Fauci points to a hasty reopening in many states as the source of the recent outbreak and warns Americans, especially young ones, to take this virus seriously to protect themselves and others. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Washington. Well, now to some developing local news. The mayor of Mount Pearl has stepped aside amid an allegation of harassment. David Aker issued a press release a short time ago saying he would temporarily step aside until the allegations are investigated. He says he'll cooperate with the investigation. The Mount Pearl Council said in a statement that a former councillor, Andrea Power, had made a harassment complaint against the mayor. She had been removed from council a couple of weeks ago over a conflict of interest. The city of Mount Pearl says it has hired an external investigator to conduct an independent review.
Welcome back to Hearing Now. The Washington Redskins made it official today. The team's name is being changed. The NFL franchise says following a review, it has decided to retire the Redskins name and logo. For decades, activists have complained the moniker is a racial slur against Native Americans. But after the killing of George Floyd and the protests against racism that followed, major sponsors like FedEx, Nike and Pepsi threatened to cut ties with the football team unless the name was changed. A new name and logo is expected to be announced in the next few weeks. Well, there are winds on the ocean that stir up white cap conditions, and then there are other winds that whip the water into snow-like foam. Wow, bad weather in parts of South Africa's southwest coast left the ground and vehicles splattered with the stuff. Meteorologists warn of an intense cold front with gale force winds up to 100 kilometers per hour. Authorities are urging residents to stay home. Chilly, wet and windy conditions are forecast to persist until Wednesday. Well, actress Kelly Preston has died. Fabulous. Preston's husband, actor John Travolta, says she died after a two-year battle with breast cancer. Her movie roles included Jerry Maguire and For the Love of the Game. Preston and Travolta met on a film set and married a few years later in 1991. The actress is also survived by two children, 20-year-old Ella and 9-year-old Benjamin. The couple's other son, Jet, died in 2009 at the age of 16 following a seizure. Kelly Preston was 57 years old. Well, that's it for our show tonight. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. I hope you can join us again tomorrow. Good night.